A little while ago I made a video called I'm Saved Now What? And in that video I recommended a few men to listen to here on YouTube. One of them was Mike Hoggard. Okay, and I just assumed everything was okay there. I really didn't have any reason to think anything bad. I've seen some of Mike Hoggard's videos and I always I thought he's a defender of the King James Bible. He seems pretty legitimate. So he should be okay. Well, I had two different uh, brothers write me, two different Bible-believing brothers write me, and they said, eh, you need to look into some things about Mike Hoggard. Um, he's got some problems on the eternal security issue and also on the rapture, which I'm not going to discuss that in great detail in this video. This is going to be mostly about his stands, Mike Hoggard's stands on eternal security. And I said, well, I'm going to need to see some proof. You're saying that he's kind of a little messed up on this thing. I need to see proof. So I was sent links to two different videos um, that Mike Hoggard put out uh, called Eternal Security and Losing Your Salvation, parts one and two. And so I sat down and I watched them both and I thought, oh boy, there are some problems there. That's what this video is going to be about. Um, I don't make it my... Uh, goal in life to, to debunk everybody out there, but the problem is I endorsed Mike Hoggard and I was shown that there are some problems with him doctrinally and so I have a responsibility because I endorsed him, I have a responsibility to you, my viewers, to warn you because of somebody I've endorsed. Okay, That's why I'm making this video. And interestingly, uh, word started getting around that I was going to do this expose, I guess, of, of Mike Hoggard. And Mike Hoggard actually contacted me. And he said, you know, that he'd like to talk about things first and, and whatever else, which is fine. That's fine. And I wrote him back an email. And I just laid out my case, you know, before him. And he never got back to me. That's been a couple weeks now. So, you know... I don't know what's going on there, but um, let me just say this. I am not exposing Mike Hoggard as a lost man. All right? I don't believe he's a lost man. I believe that he is saved. Okay, But as you're going to see in the study, Mike Hoggard is not dispensational. All right? He does not. He says at one point, he says, I, I see the word dispensation in the Bible, so I believe in dispensations. But if, if you're saying that there are different time periods and people get saved different, you know, he says, I don't believe in that. Well, you're going to see the problem that that makes when you try to go through the Bible and you don't rightly divide the word of truth. You're going to see that there's a, a big problem that's created from that. Um, when you refuse to rightly divide the word of truth, you're going to see what it leads to in this study. And that's something else I want to say. A lot of times when I expose somebody, I will use that as an opportunity to teach Bible doctrine. That's again what I'm going to do today. This is not a rip on Mike Hoggard fest. Okay? I'm not here to destroy his ministry or anything. And Mike Hoggard, if you are watching this, please watch the whole thing. Consider what you said and what I am saying as correction, okay? As a brother to a brother. That's what this thing is. Okay, now there are two main arguments that are going to be used to deny eternal security. I'm very familiar with this debate of, of can, you, can you lose it, can you keep it, you know, all this stuff. The two main arguments are Calvinism versus Arminianism, and secondly you have real versus false conversion. All right, and Mike Hoggard uses both in these videos I'm going to be showing you clips of. But the fact is, this debate is not over real versus false conversion. You see, watch some of my videos on, on uh, the marks of a false convert or uh, repentance in the true gospel. I believe, and the Bible teaches, that there are really, truly saved people and then people that are false brethren. Paul talked about being in perils among false brethren. So that's not the issue here. The issue here is when you get saved as a Christian, genuinely saved, can you lose your salvation? And if so, how do you keep your salvation? See, that's where the real issue's at. Okay? 
But what people do is they'll say, well, you have to be either a Calvinist, which believes you have no free will to get saved, but after you're saved, then you can't lose it. Or Armenian, which is you have free will, but then once you're saved, you can lose your salvation. And they say, so which one are you? And I liked a story that uh, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman told about that whole thing. He said when he was in Bible school that he was taken, you know, before the, the council, <laughs> whatever you call them, the, you know, you do your senior thesis or whatever. And they said, uh, Mr. Ruckman, are you a Calvinist or an Armenian? And he said, well, I'm an Armenian till I get to the cross, then I'm a Calvinist. I like that. Because, you know, I believe in free will for salvation. After that, I believe you can't lose your salvation. Okay? So it's not you have to either be Calvinist or Armenian. No, you don't follow either man, except for where they're right. Then you're not really following them. You're just saying, yeah, he was right there, but he was wrong over here. Okay? You have free will as a Christian or as a, as a lost person. They have a free will to become a Christian. After that, you can't lose your salvation in the church age. I'm going to show you some of that here as we go on. Okay. Let me just show you the first clip here. You're going to see that Mike admits to his former Free Will Baptist membership. Okay, Free Will Baptist being Armenian, where they are teaching that you are saved by free will, but then you can lose your salvation. You're going to see him um, mention his Free Will Baptist membership that he was formerly, and he claims he came out of it, but did he really? So let's watch this. Um, and, le and let, me just, let me just say it this way. Uh, there are two alternate viewpoints. There is what's called the Arminian position, and there is the Calvin position. Okay? And, you say, and, and again, somebody sent me a book this big on the Arminian position showing why the Calvin position is stupid. Okay? And then somebody can, from the Calvin position can send me a book this big and say why the, the Arminian, and I have them both. I have both books. Um, as you know that we used to be in the free will Baptist denomination, um, which primarily espouses what's called the Arminian position. Um, those who are of the independent Baptist group, the movement, they do not hold to an Armenian position. They hold to a somewhat of a Calvinist position. And um, they don't get along very well. Uh, Southern Baptists and so on. Um, and so what is, the, the question was, Pastor Mike, can you lose your salvation? Now, if you, if you follow my Twitter account or you follow uh, me on Facebook, you saw that up there. The two questions were, uh, can you lose your salvation and is eternal security in the Bible? Okay, and I could, I could actually make this very simple and just move on. And so the simplicity of it is, the, I'm going to answer both questions um, with the answer no. Okay, I'm going to answer both questions at the same time. The question was, can you lose your salvation and is eternal security in the Bible? And I'm going to answer the questions and say no Okay, to both questions. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Now you see in that video, he says, can you lose your salvation and is eternal security in the Bible? And he says no to both questions. Uh, that's a contradiction. Okay, um, can you lose your salvation? No, I would agree with that. Is eternal security in the Bible? And he says no to that. Well, then what he'll go on to do is, and I'm, I had to cut out a lot of this. I mean, the videos are very long. I can't play everything. But what he does is he goes on to say that the term eternal security, those two words, are not in the King James Bible. And he does this a lot, and I do it myself, so I'm not condemning it. But what I'm saying is you have to be careful with that, too, because... The word might not be there, the wording might not be there, but if what that wording stands for is there, then you, you really don't have much of a case. Uh, a good example is the Trinity. The word Trinity is not a Bible word, but the Godhead is. And you can see the thing of body, soul, and spirit, and it's one. First John chapter 5, verse 7. 
you know. That's why the new versions take it out. Okay, that's the clearest verse on the Godhead, on the Trinity. All right, but I'd like to point out something else that's interesting. Eternal security isn't in the what? Bible? Did you know that the word Bible is not in the Bible? See, it's not a real strong case. Okay, if you can prove that eternal security as a doctrine is not in the Bible, well, then you have a much stronger case. But just to say the words aren't there, it's kind of, again, like the rapture. You know, they'll say the pre-trib rapture is not in the Bible, you know, the, the wording there. Okay, so do you, and then you turn around and you say, so do you believe in a post-trib rapture? They'll say, yes, that's what the Bible teaches. Um, think about that. If the word rapture is not in there, then why are you saying it for the post-trib rapture? Be careful about those little word games that people play. But the problem here with saying no to both those questions, you know, can you lose your salvation and is eternal security in the Bible? The fact is, eternal security for a Christian is in the King James Bible. It is in there. Okay? Eternal security for someone in the time of Jacob's trouble is not true except for the one case, the 144,000 sealed Jews. They are eternally secure. Anybody else, the tribulation saints in that time period, they're not eternal, eternally secure. So you see you have two different things. And we're going to look at some of that today. That's where a lot of the confusion comes in because people try to say either the Bible teaches all eternal security or the Bible teaches all that you can lose your salvation. And it teaches both. And people try to always twist it to their side. It doesn't work that way. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. That's very important. So does Mike Hoggard rightly divide the word of truth? Does he do that? Let's look at the second clip here. I'm required to follow the faith of Jesus Christ through the King James Bible. And if you want to know what our doctrinal statement is... It's, you start reading in Genesis and get to the end of Revelation, and when you've read that, you have read our doctrinal statement. He says that his doctrinal statement is, quote, start reading in Genesis and get to the end of Revelation, and when you've read that, you have read our doctrinal statement. Really? Let's look about that. Is this a man's system or God's system? Because what he's going to say in his thing is that this dispensational teaching is, you know, Clarence Larkin and those guys, dispensationalists and things. Um, but what does the Bible say? If you're familiar with this, you know, you're, you probably already know where I'm going, but maybe you're not familiar with this. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's a command. That's not a suggestion. That's not, hey, if you'd like to, maybe you could, if you'd want to, if it works out. Uh-uh. It's a command. The fact is that Larkin, Schofield, Ruckman, and Doug Stauffer, etc., a lot of people have written on, the, a lot of men have written on the dispensational thing. It isn't those guys. It's not their system. All right? It's a command in Scripture. So don't try to say, oh, it's the teachings of a man. No, it isn't. It's in the Bible. But let me ask you a question. Mike Hoggard or anybody else out there that believes this way, you say, Genesis to Revelation. That's our doctrinal statement. Genesis to Revelation. Oh, really? Are you worried about not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Because the Bible says in Genesis... You know, Genesis to Revelation, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt, shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You say, well, that's not for us today. Well, come on, it's in Genesis. It's right there. What do you mean it's not for you? Give you another one. Are you supposed to build an ark? Genesis chapter 6 verse 14 says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. You better get busy. 
The Bible says, hey, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 that you have to build an ark. Genesis to Revelation, that's our doctrinal statement. You have to rightly divide. How, here's another one for you. How about, uh, should I sacrifice my son on an altar? Genesis 22, verse 2 says, And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Boy, I'm in trouble. I'm in big trouble. First of all, I don't even have a son. Secondly, I don't have a son named Isaac. Well, right there's a command that says that I'm to take thine only son, my only son, and go sacrifice him. But I don't have a son. What am I going to do? See? You say, oh, come on, Brian. You're exaggerating the point here. I know that. I know that. But to say, for somebody to say that our doctrinal statement is from Genesis to Revelation, how does that work? And you're going to see later, he says that the gospel is the same. Maybe I should build a kingdom for the Jews. How's that sound? Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6 says, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Well, it's a command for me. Right there, I mean, hey, it's, those two verses, they look like they're pointed at me. Genesis to Revelation, come on. How about making an atonement for my sins? Well, I'm a preacher. Let's see about this. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 3 says, If the priest that is anointed to do sin according to the sin of the people, let him bring for his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. Uh-oh. I haven't done that. You know, I mean, since I've been a preacher, since I've been preaching, I, don't, I never sacrificed a bullock for my sins. Oh man, I must be in trouble. Or maybe I can rightly divide the word of truth and see that this is not written to me. You say, but, you know, these are all in the Old Testament. And obviously, we're smart enough to realize that there's at least one dispensational difference. Old Testament, New Testament, right? Let's look about that. Matthew chapter 8, verse 4. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Huh. It was still going on in Matthew? The law? That's what's going on there in Matthew chapter 8, verse 4. Oh, and by the way, if you're dispensational, you'll realize that uh, over in Hebrews chapter 9, it talks about a testament is of force after men are dead. Okay? Jesus Christ brought in the New Testament. He's the mediator of the New Testament. The New Testament does not begin in the early part of the book of Matthew. It begins after the crucifixion with the death of the testator. A testament is a force after men are dead. But if you're non-dispensational, well, you just throw that out. But then you don't obey the scriptures that tell you to go and sacrifice animals. It's a problem. You say, well, that's okay. That's still Old Testament. You know, we don't have to do that. We're smart enough to figure that one out. How about this one? James chapter 2, verse 17 says, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Now, how does that line up with Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 and Titus 3, 5? For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So how do you rightly divide James 2.17? Without going in there and saying, well, see, when it says faith and works, it means the works there are in type the, the uh-huh. Why don't you just leave it as it stands and read James chapter 1, verse 1, which says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve 
tribes which are scattered abroad greeting. Uh, I don't remember which tribe I'm part of right now. Uh, that's because we're Jews and Gentiles in one body in the church age. But not in the time of Jacob's trouble when you have 144,000, you know, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. 144,000 Jews that are sealed. Rightly divide the word of truth. You don't go into other dispensations. You don't go into other portions of Scripture that aren't written to you and steal things from there. You make a mess of the Bible when you try to do that. How about this one? Here's another one for you. Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Hmm. Children of Israel? Revelation 7 verses 13 and 14 says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You say, See, there's Christians that survived the first three and a half years of the tribulation. <laughs> Wrong. You know why? Because as I stated earlier, there's Jews and Gentiles are part of one body, according to Galatians 3.28 and Colossians 3.11. Look it up. Right now, if you're a Jew, you're a Christian. If you're a Gentile, you're a Christian. There aren't two different distinct bodies. Okay? So, what's going on there in Revelation chapter 7? You have Jews, sealed Jews, and Gentiles. They're not the same as the church age. But not only that, notice it says there, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Wait a second, I thought a Christian today is washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm washed. I am purchased by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have to wash anything. Revelation 7.14 says that they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's works. Faith and works. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. When the rapture happens, which is pre-tribulation, a new dispensation begins in which there is faith and works for salvation. It's right there. And what happens is, when you try to take verses that don't line up with each other, that are dispensationally and for different people, and you try to blend it all together, you have to lie about Scripture. And we're going to see that as we continue here. What about this one? Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Wait a second. Where was faith at in that verse? Blessed are they that do his commandments. Period. I didn't see faith in there. You know why? Because it's referring to people in the millennial kingdom. Now, Faith is having is belief in something that you cannot see. Now, when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning on the earth for a thousand years in the millennial kingdom, how could you have faith? Go to somebody in the millennial kingdom, you say, do you believe in Jesus Christ? They'd say, yeah. He's right over in Jerusalem, ruling and reigning. And he has all of his saints walking around and stuff, reminding us to worship him, teaching us about him. There's no faith involved in the millennial kingdom. 
it's 100% works. Well now, well, I, I believe that we can reconcile all this stuff and bring it all together for a Christian today. You're crazy. You can't reconcile this stuff. Why? Because you're not supposed to. You are commanded in Scripture to rightly divide the word of truth. That doesn't mean you say, I don't believe certain portions of Scripture. That doesn't mean that. It means I understand that those portions of Scripture are for somebody else. It's like you get the mail and you're in an apartment complex or something, and there's one mail delivery or something, or you're in the military and they bring in the mail call or something, and they're going through and the guy's taking a letter and he's going, uh, Johnson, he hands it to that guy, Smith, oh, over there, you know, Denlinger, Miller, hands it to the guy. He doesn't just go, oh, here you go, it's all for you, Brian. No, you have to rightly divide. That's just common sense. You've got to rightly divide this book. You can't just be sloppy and go through there and say, you know, every chapter in the book is mine. Or every, no, I'm sorry. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. Uh, no, no, no. Let, don't, don't get your doctrine from kiddie songs. You know, little, little children's songs. I know some people do, but you got to grow up sometime. Okay. Now let's look at the clip number three, the, the third clip here, the third little video clip from his uh, thing that he did, his study that he did on eternal security and losing your salvation. Watch this. And so don't ask me, well, I mean, people ask me, they want to know, and I'm answering the question. The, you're ask, they're asking me, do you, do you believe in once saved, always saved? The answer is no. That, that phrase is not in the Bible, and I'm not being nitpicky about words. Again, we see the word game, you know, once saved, always saved is not in the Bible. Neither is the word Bible. All right, again, that doesn't prove anything. Next, he quotes two contradictory statements and then tries to bring them both together. You can't do that. Okay, God is a God of distinction. You need to understand that. He says saved and lost. Okay, not saved, lost, and working to get here and I don't really know for sure yet. I mean, think about that. Think about that. You're either saved or you're lost. You're on your way to heaven or you're on your way to hell. You're either right or you're wrong. God is a God of distinction. Okay? It's not heaven, hell, and purgatory. <laughs> One or the other. Now look at the fourth clip here. And here again, he is clearly disobeying 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Watch this. Uh, can, it be, can a person, uh, is, is there such a thing as apostasy? Can a person fall away? If you ask me, can a person fall away, I will say, it says in Hebrews 6, uh, if they shall fall away. That, I just, that's what I believe. Um, if you ask me, does God, pre does God preserve his saints? I will say yes, because that is what the scripture says. And you say, you're being contradictory, Pastor Mike. No, I don't think I am. I really don't think I am. Now you're going to see some honesty in this next clip where Mike Hoggard actually says that he does not know what dispensational teaching is. Watch this one. People say, are you a dispensationalist? Well, I'm looking here in Ephesians 1.10, and it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together and one all things in Christ. So if you ask me if there's a dispensation, I'll say yes, it says it right here that there's a dispensation. But if you're asking me if I believe in some guys, how he worded out, dis, oh, there's dispensations of this, and everything falls into this dispensation. If you're asking me if I believe that, I'll tell you no, because I don't even know what it is. I don't even know every, all the letters of TULIP. I don't ever know everything that Arminius said. I don't know that everybody, I think Clarence Larkin came up, uh, wrote a book on dispensational truth. I've never read the book. I think I have it in my library. I've never read it. Not required to. Not required to. It's like the people who, when I started the first Peter Bible study years ago, they said, oh, Pastor Mike, please stop. Stop it. You need to go to such and such doctor's website so you can be educated on the on First Peter and that we're not supposed to believe it's for us. And I'm not doing it. I'm not going to anybody's website 
looking for whether or not I should believe what's in this book. I will believe what's in this book, and I will believe every word that this book tells me to believe. Did you notice that he said that he has Clarence Larkin's book, but he won't read it? Wonder why not? He also says in response to some brethren telling him, they say about, you know, you need to, they're doing a study in Peter there, and he says, you need to, you need to check this out. You need to go to this guy's website. This is what he says here. He says, quote, and I'm not doing it. I'm not going to anybody's website looking for whether or not I should believe what's in this book. I will believe what's in this book, and I will believe every word that this book tells me to believe. Now, did you see what he did? This is deception. Okay, this is total deception. No dispensational teacher anywhere that I'm aware of, no real dispensational teacher, says to not believe the words of the Bible. Okay, what you have to do is you have to rightly divide the word of truth. You don't say all you have in here is the Pauline epistles. You know, we'll go to... Uh, We'll be real liberal here. We'll, we'll say the book of Acts. Of course, some of the hybrid dispensationalists don't believe in portions of the book of Acts. But let's just say Acts is a transition book. Um, yeah, things changing. But let's just say Acts through... This is the hyper dispensational position here. And again, I get called that. Oh, Denlinger, you're a, you're a hyper dispensationalist. Anybody that calls me a hyper-dispensationalist is just showing their ignorance. Okay, I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist. This right here is what a hyper-dispensationalist believes is for themselves. That, the Pauline epistles, Acts through Philemon, right there. That's the Bible for a hyper-dispensationalist. I don't teach that. You know, the Bible says in 1 Timothy about if any man consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ... He is proud knowing nothing. Where are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ? In the Gospels. You know, the things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. Old Testament, written for your learning. I don't teach that you shouldn't believe certain portions of Scripture. I say you need to believe the whole thing, but you need to understand who it's being written to and rightly divide it. And everybody does this. That's the thing that cracks me up. There's no one out there that says, I'm not dispensational. They're all dispensational. You have to be dispensational. Nobody is sacrificing animals right now. Nobody is worried about taking a, a bite of a fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Nobody's walking around naked like Adam and Eve were. Okay? Nobody's building an ark. Nobody's sacrificing their son on, a, on an altar. Nobody is worried about taking the mark of the beast right now, unless they're half loony, you know. Nobody is worshiping Jesus Christ in person in Jerusalem. There are different dispensations, whether you want to admit to it or not. Everybody is dispensational. Every single man, woman, and, well, saved child, everybody who's a Christian is dispensational. There's just ones that are honest enough to admit to it and others that aren't honest and don't admit to it and then try to blend things together and, and try to destroy the Scripture the way the Scripture flows and they disobey 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. That's the whole issue here. Okay. But what about this thing of uh, he, him saying, you know, and I've heard this a lot among a lot of people. They'll say, I won't study under men. Only God is my teacher. Well, let's see what the Bible says about that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now, I've said it before, and I'll say it one more time, and that is you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you're called, you get a man that's called to preach. You don't have to say, I'm not going to listen to anybody, any older men. I'm just going to read this book for myself and interpret this book for myself. Oh, well, this man over here has 50 years of ministry. Oh, uh, 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 I'm just going to listen to the Lord. I'm sorry. That's pride. 
when you don't want to listen, when you can't be corrected, that's pride. I've been corrected a bunch of times and I've had to change. You know, it's kind of like you get in a sword fight and you get backed into a corner and you're back there and you're going, okay, give me a good move, Lord. You know, get, give, me, give me something good from Scripture. Here I'm backed into a corner. And the Lord says, you're on your own, boy. <laughs> I've had that happen a couple times. You know, where I get backed into a corner, doctrinally speaking, and, and I go, oh boy, I guess I was wrong. You have to change. You have to be correctable. I don't care how long you've been in ministry, how many earned degrees, yeah, how many of that stuff you have, it doesn't matter. You have to be correctable. Now, that doesn't mean that you always have to be changing. There are some things that you've learned and been assured of, and you stick to it, okay? You don't back down. That's fine, too. But the point is, to say, I will not be taught by man, I will only have the Lord teach me. Think about something, Mike Hoggard. If that's true, then why are you teaching other men? Think about that. If you shouldn't have other men teach you the Word of God, it's just between you and the Lord, just, just between us, then what are you doing with the whole ministry teaching other men? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But uh, let's watch Mike Hoggard is pals this no man is as a teacher philosophy. Let's watch this next video clip. I believe that you, I believe that you, you could be 14 years old and you could read this Bible and understand plainly what it says. I believe you could be 90 years old and read this Bible and understand what it says. That's what I believe. Now, if anybody can just pick up the Bible without any reference to any other saved man, you know, then please explain these scriptures to me. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14 says, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6 says, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Not a novice? Hmm. Means you have to do a little bit of study, maybe listen to some older men. Yeah. Maybe read some books that are written 100 years ago. That might help. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? So, not only are you to be taught by older men, but there's a, also a sense in which if you have some carnality in your life, God's not going to reveal this book to you. There are some things that you're going to have to get rid of and, and give up in your life as a Christian before the Lord can show you the meat, the meat of the Word. He's going to have to just stay with you having milk. And I have met Christians over the years that have been saved 60, 70 years. I'm talking Christians in their 90s and they're still babes in Christ. I've met some. Okay? They still know what kids know in Sunday school. But you talk to them about major doctrine. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I never heard of that before. That's ridiculous. I never heard of that before. Why? They're babies. Carnal. Okay? More concerned with the things of the world and impressing the people in the world than they are with serving the, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot out there like that too. Now, I just want to say this. The Holy Ghost can teach you the Word of God, but it should be among many witnesses. Like Paul wrote to Timothy. There should be many witnesses. You should have confirmation. And you'll see that thing. You'll see the Lord will show you something and you go, I wonder if this is true. And and you look at it and you read it over and over again. You say, well, I wonder if, yeah, I bet that's true. And you'll listen to some guy preaching 
an older man or something, and he'll say what the Lord showed you from Scripture, and you go, wow, yeah, that was great. You know, the Lord will reveal things to you among many witnesses. But you don't just say, don't get so prideful and say, I will only read the Bible for myself and I will not listen to any other man. I won't read any other books other than the Bible and I won't, you know, whatever, whatever. No, you need to read many witnesses and rightly divide and say, is this guy telling the truth? Is he lying to me? Is he lining up with Scripture? Is, is this exposition of Scripture right? And there's going to be times that you're going to be deceived by men. I'll be the first to admit that. I've been deceived by some of my Bible teachers, some of my mentors in the Lord. And then later on I see that they were wrong. And the Lord shows me that they're wrong. And sometimes I say, well, you know, don't refer to that guy. He's no good. I used to listen to him, but he's no good now. Other times I say, well, he's still pretty good. He's just wrong in two or three areas. Again, that depends on how, how bad they are and, and how they, you know, treat the Word of God, how, what they believe about this King James Bible. I really don't listen to too many people that are using anything but the King James. Okay? Very, very uh, dangerous to do that. But it's kind of interesting. Another point I want to make on Mike Hoggard here is, uh, you know, he won't listen and won't read Clarence Larkin's book. But yet, he's always quoting from books from the occult. So you'll read books straight out of Satanism, occult type books, but you don't read Clarence Larkin? Don't have time for Clarence Larkin? It's kind of peculiar. The next, Mike Hoggard tries to compare Hebrews 3.14 with 1 Corinthians 1.8, and he tries to say that people say you have to pick one. And then he says that he sees both, and then he tries to reconcile the verses. In other words, he says, you have to either, you, either you're on one side or the other. And he says, no, I pick them both. But they don't say the same thing. Again, refusing to rightly divide the word of truth and you try to just jumble it all together, and it doesn't work. Okay? Clip number seven. Let's watch this. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm, unto the end. Now, I just read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, who shall also confirm you unto the end. There is the confirmation of God, and then in Hebrews chapter 3, 3, there is the holding fast unto the end by us. Now, here is, here is what, um, here is, here's, here's what people want to do. They say it's either perseverance or it's preservation. You got to pick one. And I'm going, well, I'm reading in the Bible, and I see them both, so why do I have to pick just one? Because both of them are there. Both themes of preservation and perseverance are in the Scripture. Why is it that somebody wants me to pick just one of them when they're both there? And here I am. I'm reading, who shall con also confirm you unto the end. That's the confirmation of the Holy Spirit. It's the sealing. I have verses on sealing up here. And then Hebrews 3 again. Um, if we, uh, a Christ is a son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. So is it, is it um, God's preservation or is it man's perseverance? Yes, both. They work together. They ne Now notice he said, and I quote here, quote, is it God's preservation or is it man's perseverance? Yes, both. They work together. Huh? God's preservation and man's perseverance work together? So then a Christian today is saved by faith and works? Really? Well, apparently so, according to the next video clip. And so God made a promise. That promise is an absolute, it is an unbreakable promise. But that promise only applies to those who start believing, stay believing, and finish believing. And God already knows who they are.
Does that make sense to everybody? Oh boy. Salvation is start believing, stay believing, and finish believing. Kind of interesting because the one passage there, the, the new versions, they take out you are saved and they put in are being saved. It's kind of Catholic. And so is saying that you have to start believing, stay believing, and finish believing. You know, die in a state of grace or something. What is this? That is works. Your works. But what about this thing? You say you have to start believing, stay believing, and finish believing to be saved. Let's look about that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13 says, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. You're part of the body of Christ if you're saved. Jesus Christ can't deny himself. You're not, you know, here, this is you as a Christian in the body of Christ, and you go, oh, you sin, so he goes whack and cuts off the thumb. And then you, you come back and you get saved again, and whoop, there comes the thumb back. And oh, you sinned again, oh, take it off again, oh, there he comes back, oh, there off you go. No, Jesus Christ can't deny himself. You notice there in verse 13, 2 Timothy 2.13, it says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. Jesus is faithful even when we're not. You know, and you say, well, then you're saying a justification of sin. You're saying that, you know, you can do anything and still be saved. We're going to cover that in just a little bit. Stay tuned. <laughs> now watch Mike Hoggard contradict himself. Okay, he says, start believing, stay believing, finish believing. Watch this next video clip. You'll see him contradict himself. We are not preserved by something that itself is not preserved. We are not preserved by corruptible things. We're not, pre hey. He says, we are not preserved by corruptible things. Uh, isn't our body corruptible? I mean, if you're having to be saved by starting believing, staying believing, and finish believing, wouldn't that be your body that does that? It doesn't work. Okay? And, it, you know, continuing in belief. You have to continue in belief to save you. I mean, it's just... Now watch him contradict himself again here in this next video clip. And the Israelites died in the wilderness without the inheritance because they didn't believe what God said. Don't tell me your little preservation, eternal security thing. They quit believing. So here he goes back to the Old Testament. Um, hello, the Israelites were not part of Christ's body. They didn't have eternal security. So you say you can, you know, you can go all over the Bible. When you're, when you're playing with this, this totally open game here where you have Genesis to Revelation to deal with doctrinally for a Christian today, well, you can prove anything. You just ignore certain parts and then you use other parts and you see, you know, and then you pretend that dispensationalists ignore areas and don't believe other areas of the Bible. That's nonsense. Total nonsense. Just incredible. Now, watch this next one. He is going to say in this video, and listen to it, I'm not making this up, he says, quote, your salvation is your responsibility. Watch this. Your salvation is your responsibility. And, and I, would say, I would say this, I would say this very, very strongly to you. What is it? That's plain down, just plain old work salvation. If, if your salvation is your responsibility, then you are believing in your mind that you are saving yourself. It doesn't work. My salvation is based on what Jesus Christ did on the cross and the fact that He purchases me. That's why I can't lose it because it's not my salvation. It's the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? I prayed for him to accept me, and he has. 
That's why he abides faithful even when I don't. Now, a lot of people are going to try to quote these verses here, you know, to justify this teaching that your salvation is your, you know, up to you. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay? That's where they're going to go and they're going to say, see, you have to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But what is this salvation in this passage? Let's keep reading. Philippians 2, 13 through 16 says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. This salvation that Paul refers to in verse 12, you know what it is? According to the scriptures here, according to the context of the passage there, it is your Christian testimony. Read it. Read the verses surrounding it there. It's talking about your testimony to the lost world. It's not talking about your salvation, your eternity. It's not talking about that. It's just saying, if, hey, if you want to make it in this life and, and be rewarded when you get to heaven, if you don't want to destroy yourself spiritually as far as uh, your testimony is concerned, if you don't want to destroy yourself, then you better have fear and trembling. You better fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear God. Depart from evil. That's what you're supposed to do as a Christian. That doesn't save you. There are a lot of people out there that fear God, okay? There are a lot of people out there that can live very, very holy lives, and they go to hell, all right? That's works. These works are meat for repentance. These are the works that do, you do after you are saved, okay? That's what's going on here. This is the salvation that Paul is writing about. It has nothing to do with whether you go to heaven or hell. Okay. Now, this next part is just like irritating, and he did this with both videos. I'm only going to show the, from the first one. He has this very worldly ending to his show. I have a big problem with this, okay? He uses something from the secular world, and then he says a bunch of things too, and I'm just going, what? So watch this. Uh, to them, all right? I, I, I love you. I thank you for loving me. I don't want to be your enemy. Um, I would like to be your friend in the Lord, okay? But I'm, let's just, let's just, if you're going to ask me, well, how come you don't, just ask me what verse, and I'll tell you what I believe, all right? God bless you. Bye. It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I want to be your friend in the Lord, you know? And he plays the Mr. Rogers theme? Huh? I mean, give me a break. What is this? You see, Galatians chapter 1 verse 10 says, for do, I now, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Now, let me just say this for the record. If you want to be my friend, the friend of Brian Denlinger, then you better love the truth. Because I'm not going to lie for you. I'm not going to lie to cover up for your feelings or, or whatever else. If you don't love the truth, you're not going to love me. Because I'm going to preach it to you. And it's not going to come across nice and smooth and, and in a way that you'll come out being my friend. I, <laughs> no, no, you know, you're not going to be my friend. I mean, I'm not going to invite atheists over for, for milk and cookies or something. I mean, they're not my friends. I'm not theirs. Okay, in the sense of compromising what I'm saying. I am a friend of the lost world in the fact I'm telling them the truth. And that's what we're supposed to be as Christians. But you don't go into ministry wanting to please people. You don't go into ministry saying, I hope I don't offend anybody. I, I, hope, I, I hope I can come out being friends with people. I'm sorry, that's just, that's weird to me. All right, 
the second broadcast on the issue. Look at the first clip. And I, let me let me just say this too, okay? And I, again, I don't want to make anybody mad because you, you think that I'm trampling on your on your doctrine. I'm not. I'm trying to help make sense of the of the consensus of what the scripture is. And yes, it looks like some so there are some verses that look like that look like it's all about eternal security and you shoot out a prayer and you're saved forever. Then there is, then there's some verses that looks like that you got work to do. Okay? And I'm trying to show you that they are not contra the Bible doesn't contradict itself. They are not contra those two ideas are not contradictory to one another. It is how God works. But let me tell you this, okay? I know I know Mike Hoggard pretty well. God knows me pretty well. My wife knows me pretty well. Okay? I just we just all know each other pretty well. Okay? And I've I've told some people this. Don't ever don't ever try to convince me that because when I was 9 years old I went to an altar and asked Jesus to come into my heart don't ever tell me that from now on it doesn't matter what I do. I'm still going to go to heaven. Because I'm going to tell you that I have such a sorry, low down, degraded, corrupt, filthy flesh with a brain attached to it that will try to convince me every day, Mike. You can do it and get away with it. You can do whatever you want to, Mike Hoggard, and you're still going to go to heaven. Don't you ever try to convince me of that. Again, you know, quote, I don't want to make anybody mad. Why not? <laughs> okay, you can't preach this book and not make people mad. The very nature of a book that calls out people's sins is going to tick people off. You can't get through it without angering someone. It's not possible. You know, Sam Jones used to say that he used to be worried about offending somebody, and now he said, I'm worried if I don't offend somebody. You get to that point after a while. Now, faith versus works. He says, basically, he's quoting some different scriptures there, and he says, these two ideas are not contradictory to one another. It is how God works. No, not in this dispensation. Rightly divide the word of truth. And then he says, don't ever tell me that from now on, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm still going to heaven. That's what he says. You just saw it in the clip there. He says, goes on to explain you know, how his flesh is filthy. You saw that too. And he says, you can do whatever you want to, Mike Hoggard, speaking like his mind to himself, and you're still going to heaven, or going to go to heaven. And then he says, don't you ever try to convince me of that. Don't you ever try to convince me of that. So let me ask you a question. So the, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't cover all sins? It just covers those up until you sin again, and then you, when you sin again, then you got to get resaved, and then resaved, and resaved, and resaved. Is that how it works? First John one seven says, "But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin." Let me just illustrate my point. Okay. You see this? This is a hammer. You say, do you have the right, Brian, or I'll ask you this, do I have the right to hit myself in the face with this? I mean, just, just as hard as I can, just boom, right in the face. Do I have a right to do that? Would God stop me if I was going to do that? No. I have a right to hit myself in the face with this. I'm not going to, so sorry to my enemies out there. I know you're probably going, yeah, please, please, please. <laughs> I'm not going to hit myself, sorry. But I have a right to hit myself in the face with this hammer. God's not going to stop me from doing it. I have a free will to smash my glasses and my eyeballs, okay? And do, you know, fractures to my head and concussions and things. 
I have a right to do that. But uh, would that cause a positive or a negative outcome for me? Not for you, for me. Um, negative. I'll put the temptation down for my enemies out there. I know you're all upset. Question. Do we as Christians have a free will and a right to sin? Will God stop you from sinning? No. You have a right to sin. If I want to go out and sin right now, if I want to go down to the store and buy some alcohol and bring it back here and drink it on camera, I could do that if I felt like it. If I wanted to cheat on my wife, if I wanted to go shoot somebody or whatever, I could do it. And I wouldn't lose my salvation. But let me ask you a question. If I would do those sins, would it cause a positive or negative outcome? Negative. Very negative. Right? Okay, so what you need to realize is all sin is negative. Just like every time you get hit in the face with a hammer, it's always negative. Okay, there's never a time when you would hit yourself in the face with a hammer and you'd say, hey, that felt good that time. You know, <laughs> every time you get hit in the face with a hammer, it's going to be negative. That's called a law of science. And sin is the same way. Every time that you sin, it's always going to be negative. So you're only shooting yourself in your own foot when you sin. Because, you know, these people that don't believe in eternal security, they'll say, you know, I say, well, you know, there's nothing that you can do to be unborn again or to be kicked out of the body of Christ. And they say, well, then I can just go on out and sin. It's interesting that they would bring that up. But, they, you know, I can just go on out and sin and I won't lose my salvation. Sure, go ahead. Hit yourself in the face with a hammer. That's what sin is. It's a good picture of sin here. I'm going to go look at this pornography and destroy my mind. Whap. I'm going to go smoke these cigarettes, which are going to cost me a lot of money, and give me lung cancer. Whap. I'm going to go drink this alcohol, which is expensive, and it's probably going to make me wreck my vehicle or make me, you know, throw up in the morning or whatever. Whap. I'm going to go cheat on my wife. And that's going to put me through divorce court and I'm going to lose all my money and stuff like that. Whap. See? Can a Christian sin and still be saved? Absolutely. But it's not that, well, then you get to do all this fun stuff. Uh-uh. Every sin that you do is negative. You're only hurting yourself when you sin. But you say, well, I just don't, I don't believe that this is right. You're, you're giving justification for Christians to go out and sin. And you're saying that they can't lose their salvation. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay? If you're stupid enough to go out and sin and mess around with the flesh, hey, that's your problem. All right? If you're not smart enough to figure out that sin is negative, then I can't help you anyhow. But you say, well, a Christian can't lose anything then when they sin? Oh, no, you can lose a lot of things here on this earth. You can't lose your salvation, but here's what you can lose. You can lose your health. You can lose your testimony. You can lose your joy. You can lo use, lose eternal rewards. You can lose millennial inheritance. And even get to the point where you can lose your life. Say, prove it. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 28 through 32 says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. In other words, if you are partaking of communion and you're just like flippantly just, eh, whatever, you know, this is no big deal. You're not discerning the Lord's body there. You're not understanding the sacrifice that he paid for you. Okay. It's not teaching that communion is a holy sacrament like mass or transubstantiation, the Eucharist, all that ungodly nonsense. It's not teaching that. All it's saying is if you don't discern the fact of what Jesus did for you, you're eating and drinking damnation to yourself. Okay? Verse 30. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In the passage there, it's talking about Christians that don't care about what Christ did for them. They just get carnal and worldly. Verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. 
wait a second. When God judges us for our sins, we're chastened of the Lord. We're punished. You know? Whack, whack, whack. We're chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world? You mean you don't lose your salvation? That's right. God can make you sick. God can destroy you financially. He can even kill you and take you to heaven, but he will not take your salvation no matter what you do. If you are genuinely born again, and I'm not talking about false converts, I'm talking a genuinely born again Christian, you can do whatever you feel like doing. If you're stupid enough to destroy your life with sin, you're going to pay for it. You're going to pay big time for it. I mean, you'll have some Christian that, that messed around and with fornication and drugs and alcohol, whatever else, and gets to heaven. God kills him early. You know, he gets to heaven. Guess what? He's got eternity to look forward to as a loser. Yeah, he's saved. Yeah, he's part of the body of Christ. But he's going to get up there. Judgment seat of Christ, it's like a bonfire, you know. All of his works are burned up. And, you know, he gets a little piece of gold. It's a, like a one ten ounce gold coin or something. There's your rewards. Flick, you know. That's going to be it for eternity. And you tell me that's not a bad thing? But you see... Let me just say this before I continue. If you teach that people can lose their salvation, oh, guess what? Now you have control over people. See, if I can, if I can pass judgment on you, if I have leadership position in a church, and I can tell you that you're lost, and I can threaten it over you, and I can hold it over you and say, if you're doing this or you're doing that, you've lost your salvation. Guess what? I can control you. Catholics do it, the Mennonites do it, a lot of people do it, okay? They hold that thing over their people and they say, if you dare to do whatever we tell you not to do, then you'll lose your salvation. You know, we'll pronounce our anathemas on you. That's what they do. Clip number two. Let's watch this one here, and you're going to see about he says, God's salvation is the same way for everybody. He does not have a different salvation for some people. John Hagee. Watch this. And by the way, it's the salvation. God's salvation is the same way for everybody. He does not have a different salvation for some people. John Hagee. I don't care what John Hagee teaches, okay? And I'm not even familiar with what he teaches dispensationally. But the fact is, it's the Bible. What does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches that God's salvation is not the same for everybody. You say, heresy, that's heresy. No, it's called dispensational teaching. It's called rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, if God's salvation is the same for everybody, how did Adam and Eve, what was their plan of salvation in the Garden of Eden? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You're out of your mind. Jesus didn't die on the cross yet for another couple thousand years. What about uh, Abraham? You say faith. Sure, okay. But uh, what was the faith in? What God told him. He didn't have faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ hadn't come yet. Jesus Christ hadn't died on the cross yet. You say, well, he got saved by looking forward to the cross. Again, you're out of your mind. If people got saved by looking forward to the cross, then why is it when Jesus Christ showed up over and over and over again, he says, he signifies what death he's going to die, dying on the cross. And they're going, what? No, you know, Peter says, be it far from thee, Lord. That is one of the biggest lies out there to deceive people that they got saved by looking forward to the cross. They did not. And what about people in the millennial kingdom? How can they have faith in somebody who's there physically on the earth? What about people in the, in the coming time of Jacob's trouble? What if they are saved? They say, with faith alone and you're, you have eternal security. How can they? If they take the mark of the beast, they go to hell. No, this thing of God's salvation is the same way for everybody. He does not have a different salvation for some people. That is a lie. 
Mike Hoggard, you're showing your ignorance of Scripture. It's very clear in the Bible that he has different salvations for different groups of people. He dispenses salvation differently to different time periods, different times of people there. That's why it's called dispensational teaching. Next, we're going to see Mike flip-flop again and tries to make the issue about a false convert. Watch this one. It's, we are in the testing stage of our life right now, working out our salvation with fear and trembling. And yes, we are preserved. If you are truly saved, you're preserved. The problem is some people are not truly saved, and yet they put on like they are. Okay. Now let's go with this line of reasoning for a minute. So what should a man do if he's a false convert? Okay, you say, well, a man is there and he's sinning and stuff like that, so it proves he was never truly saved. Okay, let's go with that. The man's a false convert. Now, what does he need to do from here on out? Get saved? Sure, okay. But what if he sins again after he gets saved? Should he get saved again? So, is salvation completed when you finally overcome all of your sins? Do you get to a point where you're sinlessly perfect and now you know for sure that you're saved? Uh, nonsense. Absolute total nonsense. Now we're going to watch him flip-flop again and talk about the earnest in our hearts after, you know, because you're being sealed by the, or you are sealed by the Holy Ghost. Okay? Watch this. That's earnest. And God, even though we still inhabit this flesh, we can know and have assurance that we are saved because of the earnest of the spirit that is in our hearts. That's the sealing of the Holy Ghost. Now he's right in what he's saying. You do have a witness in your spirit there. You're, the Holy Ghost will witness, will bear witness there, that earnest in your spirit when you are sealed with the Holy uh, Spirit of promise there, the Holy Ghost of promise, when you are sealed, yeah, then you know that you are truly saved. But that just contradicted what he said before. Okay? That's a problem. Now next we're going to see Mike Hoggard speak total heresy by claiming that, quote, the gospel is the entire word of God from Genesis to Revelation. That's what he says. Watch this. But here again, we have it. We have the gospel further defined. After that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. The gospel is the entire word of God from Genesis to Revelation. You cannot, you cannot say, well, I believe John 3.16 but I don't believe Genesis 1, and I don't believe the book of Jonah. I don't think a whale could have swallowed Jonah, and I don't believe this. You don't believe the word of truth, hence you don't believe the gospel. Now, did you see him do it? This, this stuff is so deceptive here, I just, I got a big problem with this. He plays the mind game again. He says that you must believe the whole Bible. You have to believe the whole Bible. And this dispensational thing, you know, you don't, you don't, they're telling you don't believe certain parts of the Bible. I believe every word in the book. I, but I understand that there are certain things that are not written directly to me. So I say, I believe that that was for Moses. I believe that that was for the children of Israel. I believe that's for a tribulation saint. Saint. I believe that that's for a millennial saint. Okay. I believe that's for a Christian in the church age. I believe that that's for somebody in the Old Testament. I believe everything in it, but I understand that I have to rightly divide the word of truth. Finally, the last clip I'm going to show you here, he misquotes 2 Timothy 3.16, and he changes the meaning of the text. Watch this one. All of them. All scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Well, there it is. See, there it is right there. 
And what I'm telling you is, if that is printed in this book, it is doctrine. It is profitable for doctrine. Okay. Now notice he says there, quote, And what I am telling you is, if that is printed in this book, it is doctrine and is profitable for doctrine. Now, the verse there in 2 Timothy 3.16 says it's profitable for doctrine. That means profitable. Okay, there are certain parts that are profitable for doctrine. But again, you have to rightly divide. I mean, one chapter earlier, one chapter and one verse earlier, it's saying, 2 Timothy 2.15, that you're to rightly divide the word of truth. And then it says later on, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Okay? That doesn't mean you say the whole Bible is doctrine for us today as Christians. No, it's profitable for doctrine. You will see things that overlap. Certainly, there are things that overlap. There's never been a time when you go to some other place than heaven and hell. Okay? As final destinations. Let me say it that way. All right? There has never been a time where, you know, God and Satan switched positions or something, okay? There are things that overlap in the scriptures. You know, and the whole thing is, you know, saying that the gospel is from Genesis to Revelation, I mean, a child could point out the fact that we don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. I mean, this is elementary, you know? I mean, this, this is not, I mean, it's just sloppy. Everything in here, everything in the whole Bible is for us today. Everything in here, this is the gospel. This is our doctrinal statement. That is nonsense. Absolute, total nonsense. I mean, I'm sorry, but Mike Hoggard, you ought to be ashamed of yourself coming out with that kind of thing. That's bad. That's real bad. Now, let me just make a couple points here in conclusion. Mike Hoggard, like all non-dispensational Christians, cannot handle verses of Scripture which are written to other people. They can't. His system of no eternal security leads to a false gospel where people must trust their own good works to be saved. That's what it really boils down to. I mean, you know, if you have to start believing, keep believing, finish believing, that's works. And it's very dangerous. And, I, you know, honestly, I don't believe that he believes that way, you know, to be saved. I think that he has put his faith in Jesus Christ and things, and you know, but he just, he's not dispensational. So he makes a mess of the Bible. It's just plain and simple. Okay? It just, it, what it does is it leads to a life of self-righteousness and fear, constant fear that you're going to lose your salvation. I mean, I've been around that mentality. I came from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. You know, conservative Mennonite, the whole deal there. Most of them don't teach eternal security. And those people live in constant fear. You know? It's really no different than Catholicism. Why? Well, you know, the Mennonite system came out of Catholicism. Menno Simon was a Catholic priest. Took a lot of Catholicism with him. You know, any kind of Protestant Reformation type church you probably want to stay away from it. Okay? Bible-believing Christians, you know, the Anabaptist movement, a lot of them, they were around before the Protestant Reformation. That's another study. But, um, you know, I am all for preaching against false conversion and sin. Okay? I just want to state that. There are people that... You know, you, need to, you do need to examine yourself, whether you be in the faith, I understand that. If you're really struggling with sin and you really don't know for sure if you're saved, make sure that you're saved, okay? But when you've done what the Bible tells you to do to be saved and, you know, you're willing to live for the Lord and you're, you're trying to fight sin and whatever else and you have put your faith entirely in Jesus Christ, you got to get to a point where you just rest in that, okay? Don't worry about losing your salvation if you're genuinely saved. You're not going to ever amount to anything for the Lord. Okay? And one of the best ways to get assurance of salvation is to get busy working for the Lord. Go out and witness to people. And then you'll see how bad the world is out there and how bad lost people are. And you'll realize, hey, you know what? I think I am saved. And especially when they start to attack you and start to make fun of you and, and mock you and things like that. Bear a little bit of reproach for Jesus Christ. you have assurance of salvation. But... Um, 
you know, uh, another thing you want to remember too here is if you are saved, your sins will only lead you to, or only lead to you living a horrible life now and in eternity. So, you know, again, this, this thing of, of, you know, well, you're teaching that a Christian can sin and, and live in sin for the rest of their life and they won't lose their salvation. Sure, I'm teaching that. Not that you can just go out and have free license to sin. I mean, you have it, but you're stupid if you do it because all sin is negative. You aren't going to lose your salvation no matter how hard you try. But if you're dumb enough to go out and sin and mess around with sin, it's going to wreck your life. And you're going to have nothing to show for it in eternity. And God's going to give you a bad weapon. And you don't want God's bad weapon. Okay? I've had, you know, that a few times. You don't want it. Okay? Uh, two more points, and then I'm done. First of all, you need to get it through your head. You cannot lose your salvation as a Christian before the rapture. Okay? Again, that's when the dispensation ends. When the church age ends and a new, that time of Jacob's trouble begins, it's the rapture. When the body of Christ goes up, a new dispensation comes in. Things change. I'm not worried about the mark of the beast right now. But if somebody misses a rapture, you better be worried about the mark of the beast. Because it doesn't matter how much faith you have, how many good works you're doing. If you take the mark, you go to hell. Read Revelation 14 verses 9 through 11. Now, Mike Hoggard, if you have watched this video, then you need to take some time to read and to study dispensational teaching. I know you're a busy man. I know what it's like to be in ministry and you're getting all the emails and you've got sermons to prepare and all that other stuff. i got a prophecy seminar coming up here in, on Sunday, which is uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you know, four days or whatever away from right now. It's Wednesday night as I'm recording this. I got a lot of work going, but there are times that you have to just say, okay, hold on to the work, and you just need to sit down and you need to study if you don't understand something, or keep your mouth shut about it. You're wrong on your stand about eternal security. The King James Bible does teach that a Christian cannot lose their salvation because it's not yours to lose. Your salvation, you are bought with a price by the blood of Jesus Christ. He cannot deny himself. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. Okay? Jesus Christ has paid for your sins. They're gone. They've been taken away. All of your sins, past, present, future. And if you say, well, then I can live in sin, go right ahead. Hit yourself in the face with a hammer as many times as you want. See how it works out. Okay? So, until Mike Hoggard gets that thing fixed up, if he continues in this stand against eternal security, then I can't endorse him. If Mike Hoggard cleans up that and comes out and says, not because of me, you know, I confess I, I was proved wrong or whatever, just become dispensational because of the Bible, because of what the Holy Spirit teaches, because of what he reveals to you from the Word, you know. That's the issue here. This is the standard. I'm not the standard. The book's the standard, okay? And if Mike Hoggard comes out and he says, I was wrong, I believe the King James Bible, I do see the right divisions there. I, I did look into it. The proper divisions are very clear. If he does that, praise the Lord. I'll say, hey, check out Mike Hoggard's stuff. Go watch his videos and things like that. Praise the Lord. And I, I have some of Mike Hoggard's videos up on my website, kingjamesvideoministries.com you know, videos where he's attacking the new versions, defending the King James Bible, I'm not going to take the videos down. Okay? I'm going to leave them there. But I have to have this video here to warn people, to warn the brethren, because I've endorsed them, I have to warn people, be careful about Mike Hoggard. Okay? I have to do that. I, I feel it's my duty to do that. So, Please be careful about this thing of people saying that you can lose your salvation. You cannot lose your salvation right now as a Christian in the church age. At the age that we're living in, when the rapture hits, yeah, then you have a problem. All right, if you're lost. So that's going to be it. Thank you for listening. And stay away from hammers 
and hitting yourself in the face with it. Sin. That's it.